Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Digital Savages Challenging the Status Quo podcast with your host, Amir Sabirovic. On the last episode of Challenging the Status Quo podcast, we had Jeroen Brugman, the CEO and founder of Ikigai Coffee. Here is what Jeroen had to say. One would be uh, Seth Godin. I love Seth Godin. As, uh, everything he creates, I, I live and breathe. It's insane. Just yesterday, I'm in the middle of a new audiobook he, uh, he has written. This guy is so full of... I'm, uh, I don't even understand. How can he know so much? It's, how can he understand it? He's, he's not a hippie. It's, and it continues to amaze me. So Seth Godin is one. One book I'm in the middle of right now is The, the Icarus um, Deception. Super interesting. Um, so, uh, and, and the other two, yeah, who would that be? That's a good question. I, I, currently, I have a Seth Godin as a, maybe uh, Timothy Ferris might be interesting. And um, because I have consumed a lot of his uh, material. If you're curious about the rest of the story, well, go one episode back, listen to Jeroen, and let's tune in to our following guest. Today, our guest is investor, fundraiser, CEO at Picaro World, founder at Tech Lobby, co-founder ELT Songs, director at Tech Press, and Read Smart. It's too much to imagine, and I just found out she was raised at the same river as me, Una, which is the most beautiful river in the world. So. Please welcome Daniela Cholich. Hi, Daniela. Nice to have hi, you on the show. Hi, hi. Thank you for having me. Um, and thank you for that lovely introduction. Thank you. Um, hey, you mm-hmm. have listened to the podcast. Of course, you know the story. So, of course, we want you to spill your guts and tell us all about your journey through your childhood up to where you are right now. Mm-hmm. Because... Uh, these are so many things that you're doing and they sound really awesome and I'm quite certain they are, but of course it's much easier to hear it from you. So can you give us your background and how you got where you are right now? Yes, absolutely. I'd love to. Um, Well, I am currently um, based in the UK and I flicker between London and Tunbridge Wells, but I was born and raised for the first five years of my life in Bosnia-Herzegovina, former Yugoslavia. Um, I was born in a place called Priedor, Kozaraz. Some of my family are from there. And a lot of my family are from um, Krupa, which is um, just outside of Bihać, where you are from. (laughs) So um, this has started off very well. I um, came to the UK as a refugee at the age of five. Um, because um, my mother was left um, with my brother, who was then four, there's a year difference between us, um, on her own after my father was um, murdered um, for his wealth. So my father was um, a guy called Fadil, and he um, was a businessman. He had... um, automotive businesses across Europe. He was um, into lots and lots of different things, but he was um, also on the hit list to be struck down um, during the war because he had the wealth and, and money to start a rebellious army against um, against the attack. So um, unfortunately, um, one of the first and earliest memories I have um, back in Bosnia is, um, you know, watching my father get shot and then he managed to run away and um, watching my mother scream and run after him, you know, as he was charged in front of a tank being shot, Um, you know, and and remembering watching my brother's face, my grandmother's face that was standing there and the other children screaming after the men and the fathers that were being, the grandfathers, the the brothers and the sons that were being pulled away. Um, very strangely, when I was standing there and all of this was going on in front of me, I, I, had, I had almost like, it was like a shock syndrome, I suppose. Um, and it was almost like this, this, this grown-up thing entered me. And I just thought about my mother and my grandmother and my brother and how they must be feeling. And I thought, 
right, well, you know, at that age, somehow I remember thinking, I have to take charge, like I have to do something, what can I do? And I remember the anger and the frustration and the sadness. Anyway, um, throughout that year, we were in a number of refugee camps and we were um, hungry, tired. Um, I caught tuberculosis, so I caught TB um, just before we were taken out of a concentration camp um, and driven over the border to Croatia um, by some soldiers um, into a refugee house in Croatia. But then, yeah, they found out that I had TB. So after, um, you know, what happened back home, watching the devastation, our house was um, bombed um, because, uh, and all of the um, the ground around the house was turned over because obviously um, the, the opposing armies were looking for valuables. Um, my mum was burnt alive on a sofa because they were trying to torture information about my father out of her um my um and she was threatened that she would also be killed if when they when the army came back within half an hour she didn't have money and gold sitting there for them um and after that we um managed to escape through um i remember the shooting bullets through the farm fields with my grandmother carrying my brother and my mom carrying me and get away but we were then again put into a concentration camp when they caught up with us and we were in that concentration camp for what I remember to be weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, and then finally, we were taken out of that concentration camp and over the border to Croatia, which is where we went to the refugee house. And then my mum found out that both my brother and I had TB. Um, and we were both rushed to a hospital, um, again, war torn down hospital um, in, in a part of Croatia um, called Sisak which had, um, on the kids' ward, had children who had been through, you know, tr- worse and traumatic, more traumatic experience than me, you know, with limbs missing, who'd caught all different types of illnesses and diseases. And um, I was treated there for um, a couple of months. Um, obviously, the hospital was quite far from, you know, my mother was far away from the hospital, so it's very difficult for her to come and see me in the middle of a war. So I'd see my mother only once every single week. So at the age of five, I remember that kind of, um, that experience as well. And then my brother was admitted with TB. So um, it was great to have him in the, it sounds really bad, but it was great to have him there as, you know, companionship in the hospital, but it wasn't great that he caught TB. Um, and in the end, we, um, my mum found out that my uncle, an uncle of mine called Senad, was um, rescued from a refugee camp in Trnopole in Bosnia by the British Red Cross, and he was brought to the UK. And my uncle Senad uh, managed to trace us down, or the survivors of what had been from that family. That's my mum's brother her younger brother, and he managed to um, get us over from Croatia to the UK via the British Red Cross. Um, So we came over under refugee status in uh, the end of 92, so December 1992 going on 93, if I remember correctly, and um, we went to Cambridge um, to a refugee centre with um, other people who were also refugees, all from Bosnia. Um, and we were soon given clothes, food, water, you know, rooms, bedrooms. It was like a like a mini hotel um, and put into school, really. So from the UK, I remember coming to the UK, not being able to speak English at all. Um, but I was rushed into the school system very quickly because, you know, they had this centre full of like these kids running around who'd just been through, like, you know, just witness all of this stuff. And, you know, psychologists couldn't do anything. And all these therapists we spoke to were like, what do we do with them? iPads weren't a thing. Phones weren't a thing. I mean, how do you stop, you know, these kids? Nightmare. And um, anyway, so we were all like sent off to schools. Um, The school I went to um, in Cambridge, um, very loving school to start with. Um, however, I struggled with the language, so I didn't speak English, they didn't speak my language, and to be honest, I was, 
more worried about what was happening to my brother in the classroom next door and trying to protect him than I was about trying to learn anything. Um, after Cambridge, <clears throat> we moved to um, Essex in the UK again um, and were given a um, council house by the council. Um, so what they were doing with the refugee centre was that they were finding places for people to live all over the country and offering them housing. So um, my mum, myself, my small brother and my grandmother moved to um, Essex and then I was put into primary school there on. At primary school, um, I, I didn't feel like I ever really fit in, to be honest, and um, because I, I do tend to challenge what's going on around me and um, I feel like I need to create a, a space or a, an idea or something that makes me feel. I, I, I need a lot more stimulation to feel alive than I would say a normal person does. And um, business is a good <laughs> way, legal, to put all of that <laughs> into <laughs> <laughs> if that's allowed to be said um no because I feel like if you've been through this um traumatic experience as a child that lives in you you cannot psychologically you know push these these feelings out of yourself and you know as you grow older and as you grow into adulthood you choose um or your your environment chooses where you channel um, those emotions and those feelings and how you channel them and I feel that everything I do today has arisen from me turning the negative into the positive and turning the no's into yeses and turning the uh, this can't be done to yes it can um, for me um, the impossible is only impossible if you choose for that to be um, but personally, I make the impossible possible as much as I possibly can whenever I can, just for a kick, really, to be honest. <laughs> just to give me a kick. Um, <laughs> anyway, so going back, um, <laughs> um, so going back, I um, went to school, always found myself challenging, you know, when there, there was a piece of art to create, they would say, we'll draw a vase of flowers and I would draw, you know, the flowers dying or something or some flowers coming to life and a... Or, um, you know, write a story. Mine would always, always be very vivid outside of the box if there is such a thing. Um, primary school, all cool. Went to secondary school. Again, you know, I just, I just always owned my own identity. I didn't even try to fit in with the cool people at school, in fact. But, you know, people experience bullying. They experience these awful things in teenagehood sometimes and some good things. But, you know, puberty and, and, and becoming a teenager is tough. But when I speak to people about that now, I do not have any recollection of thinking, oh, the world hates me, everyone's against me, I don't like my parents. You know, no, I was always just thinking like, how the hell, what do I do next? How do I get out of that council house and like, you know, go and go and get something and, and support my family? Um, as the oldest girl in, as the oldest girl, as the oldest child in my family um, in the UK with them, obviously, I learned English before the adults and um, my my family needed help. They needed help going to the doctors. They didn't speak English. They needed help. Um, my brother had to be taken care of when my mum had to go out and get a job when I was seven years old. Um, you know, somebody had to take care of the house. Somebody had to take care of um, the family. Somebody had to translate the letters in English, um, you know, uh, forms, take people to the doctors. That was all done by me on top of going to school. So school was never really, I, I just did my schoolwork, I got on with it and I moved on. I didn't find it challenging as life. And therefore for me, it, the, the, the rigid approach that the education system had when I was in it and the you know, non-acceptance of the outsider, it was just something that I was like, okay, you're not gonna accept me. I'm bored I move on and, and I went back into life and life was always what interested me more and helping other people um you know taking on responsibility and yeah I, I half-handedly raised my brother from from such a young age um and then went to after secondary school went to college um and again 
Um, you know, I, I never wanted to hang out with a popular clan. Um, they seemed to like me for some reason, but, you know, it was probably because I was always <laughs> challenging the status quo. And um, I believe that schooling, I talk about schooling, yes, it's far back, but it really taught me something. And, you know, what the school system taught me as it is, and this is, you know, this, this I find this almost heartbreaking to say, um, you know, and, and this could continue to go on unless we, we all do something about the way that the education system sits at the moment. Um, is it, it taught me that the less I fit in, the more I tend to achieve, the more that I get done. And I won't be ignored if I fit in. I can only be ignored. If I, if I, no, sorry, I can't be ignored if I don't fit in. I can only be ignored if I fit in. And I find that has got me to, to a place in life that now, you know, I, I feel like I've achieved and, and succeeded and can help others to do the same. And um, I've always been a rebel. I can't help that. Um, you know, I'm a rebel just for kicks, that song. I mean, you know, it transpires. I've always been the black sheep. Um, I, I just can't sit still. I don't, you know, I, I start one company up. And I'm like, great, running itself. Let's move on to the other one. People are like, are you mad? Yes, yes. It, you know, I maybe I am mad, but it keeps me from doing, um, you know, other things that, that are less, less valued of my energies. And um, I, I feel like if you're the odd one out and you are the black sheep and you're the rebel, you're the misfit, as you, as you said right at the beginning, um, I think I think that that is the perfect change maker recipe. It's like the recipe for the magic potion that you could drink to become a change maker, you know. And I feel like we've suppressed, you know, society suppresses children. It's a, the, the education system suppresses them into becoming what we want them to become. As you said um, when, when we spoke just before um, the interview, I, I feel like. Um, you know, these massive corporate giants have a, you know, you enter it, and I come from a corporate and a startup background, so I have the balance, but you get given a job spec and you get told what to wear, um, what the, um, you know, what the job is, how you should do that job, what particular skills and only those skills you need to do that job. Very rarely there's a job spec in a corporate state, you know, come and be yourself, teach me something you know? And um, so, yeah, I think at college, I started stirring up ideas about business. Um, however, I started my first job. My first job was when I was um, 11, actually. So um, bringing up my brother, mum didn't have money um, to, you know, get us computers and, um, and things like that. She always took great care of us, always had food, you know, in Bosnian families, cultures, coffee, food, um it's something that brings people together and even when you've got nothing somehow they bring food to the table and they make something out of nothing you know and um I learned many life skills and at 11 I went to work in a restaurant as a Saturday job washing up in the kitchen and I was paid three pound 20 an hour um for working 10 till 5 um on a Saturday um, and that was enough pocket money for me to buy my brother bits and pieces, you know, help my mum a little bit around the house and then get myself the things that I wanted instead of asking my mum. And then I've worked um, ever since I was 11 years old. So, you know, 15, 16 at college, I was um, working in a, a men's clothes shop um, in another restaurant, um, in two restaurants, actually, to get through college. And um, at college, I studied uh, history, um, sociology, and I did maths, and um, I did German, actually, in year one as well. I did do German at college, too. Um, oh, and English language from the um, linguistic perspective, not to learn the actual language itself. I'd kind of grasped that by then. Um, so... I went on from college to university and I, my family, of course, typical Bosnian family, wanted me to study medicine or law. Um, <laughs> and I really tried. I did the specs. I tried to look into it. However, I ended up studying um, linguistics and psychology um, at the University of Greenwich to start with. Um, 
I loved the experience. I lived at university um, for year one when I was 18 and held down another, you know, couple of jobs in retail um, in um, Oxford Street in London and, um, again, restaurant plus retail. So actually I held down three jobs while I was at university. Um, I bought my own laptop. I paid for my own fees. I paid for my own accommodation. And um, I was quite used to running running things for myself since a very young age. Um, university, again, one of those, I think I've only ever made, I think I made one very good friend at university. Um, we can definitely call one of my best friends a misfit. Um, and I think that's why we found each other at university. But again, even in my university class, it was just made up of um, people who were, great students fantastic students handed their work in on time and they just got it they just you know they they had the money to fund their fees and you know and so on and, and I used to they, they used to come in and it was just all such a breeze it was also flowy for them how you know what what how, how do you do it like how I find it more difficult to fit in than I, than I don't than not to fit in anyway so university was um an experience actually because I had to, you know, I was paying back. I was paying back to the government. I was paying back to to buy actual school books. It was different to when I was at school or college and earning money, you know, just as pocket money to buy clothes and things. But university, you really had to, like, you know, fend for yourself, cook for yourself. There's no um, grandmother Esma's burek anymore or, you know, things like that. And, yeah, that was, a, that was an experience. But, um, again, the system um was challenging for me um I remember my dissertation I appeared two minutes after the deadline of when it was due in and the lady who took the dissertation um from me said it's two minutes late we can't pass it through I was like what and um so I remember I decided to I sat down and um I sat down on the floor by the radiator and protested until they accepted the dissertation um, because I'd worked really hard and my printer broke because I had a second-hand printer because I couldn't afford a new printer when I went to university and it wouldn't print out the dissertation. I then went to the university library. There was this massive queue because there was one printer to share between, you know, hundreds of students in the library at that time, everyone chewing with their dissertation. And I thought, no way, you are not going to stop me adding this in just because my printer broke because I couldn't afford to buy a printer because I'm standing here paying for university fees, your <laughs> university fees, you will take my dissertation. <laughs> anyway, very peaceful protest. It, it worked. Um, and uh, after university, I went into teaching and I taught um, in, in Greenwich in London. I taught adults English, the English language, how to speak English. Um, but you know, I, I really enjoyed that, actually. I enjoyed learning from people from different countries who had been through lots of different experiences and were not streamlined, um, you know, or picked by university or picked by a college. These kids were here because, you know, they came to England to learn English and they all had different pathways to go to. And um, I actually, I talked um, kids, teenagers and adults um, English after about two months, I think I got my first promotion at the um, private language school in Greenwich, and that was to become the um, to become a teacher trainer. Um, and then I became a content writer. Um, I commissioned quite a few um, online projects, so you know, starting up online language schools, um, doing coursework through online platforms, creating apps. Um, all still quite forward thinking back then. Um, you know, so I, you know, two or three months again, later on, I became the direct, one of the youngest directors of, um, Trinity College, that Trinity College had ever had, um, as a director of Trinity College teacher training department. And then I was part of the group that commissioned the first ever Cambridge University online teacher training program, basically to become a globally recognized English language teacher you go through, um, you can go through the university pathway, but you can also take um, teacher training qualifications with Trinity College London or Cambridge University. And um, I have, I have directed both of those. And I think I was around 23, 23 going on 24. Um, 
after I did that, I um, found out that uh, my, my partner at the time, um, John, and um, I, we moved into a flat together. And it was the first time that, because I only lived at university in the first year, I then moved back home for the second two years and traveled in and out to save some money. And then um, at 20... Uh, three I decided to move in with John and um, shortly after that I was pregnant and um, we decided to start up our first company together and um, we started up a company called Online School English or as it's now known OSE Education Um, and I was pregnant at that time and we decided that we should leave London and go somewhere where we could do what we were good at. So that was teaching, teacher training, course design, development, um, gaining or getting people to understand where technology is going and starting to create these online apps and schools and things. Everybody thought we were still, you know, the online school, what? This was only, what, eight, nine years ago? So but even, even eight, nine years ago, technology was like, well, you know, how's this online learning going to work? Um, we then went to uh, move to Qatar in the Middle East, very random, uh, to work with the British Council. So um, I moved to the Middle East to Qatar pregnant to 52 degrees, I think it was the last time, I think I remember. Yeah, it was 52 degrees um, in the heat. And um, we moved out to the Middle East to work for the British Council um, and to do a, a teacher program out there. Um I loved it. I loved Qatar. I loved um, some of the some of the culture really related with me in terms of it reminding me of back home, the food, the smells, the family, how that how they um, you know are together. We were there during Ramadan as well, so you know it reminded me of what um, you know my grandmother was doing back here. Um, and then from Qatar, when we moved back to the UK, and the reason we moved back was because I wanted to have my daughter here in the UK where I had family around or what was left of the family. Um, and when we came back, I had my daughter. Um, I had quite a traumatic childbirth, actually. Um, I was, you know, told um, that I would need a blood transfusion, which didn't happen. And um, it was like three days of labor. Um, and, um, you know, I was very weak afterwards and I, I did almost die during childbirth and I was told that they were very shocked that I'd even survived through it. Um, I dislocated a hip and popped the bottom of my spine, my coccyx in half. Um, so, I mean, my grandmother did tell me I didn't have childbearing hips and that, you know, it would be a struggle. However, um, (laughs) so don't listen. (laughs) Um, Anyway, so when Emila was born, my daughter, we, um, we, I, I had, a, you know, I couldn't pick her up for six weeks because of the problems that I had. You know, um, I decided to breastfeed, which obviously I was out of work for that time. Um, and John continued to, um, you know, run the business. And that business still runs 10 years later um, in the UK and um, in China, which we'll get to as well. Um, so, yeah, it was motherhood for me was something wonderful and beautiful and um you know looking at or predicting where my daughter's future is or how it's you know where it's going um keeps me researching the generation z where they need to go what they need to do what we need to learn from them not what they need to learn from us that's long gone that's like you know that that kind of ship has sailed Uh, we need to flip reverse um, how or what we do with with Gen Z, and you know how we listen to what they need, um, and you know a lot of my work in education is around the future of education, um, or the future of not too much education, and the idea of allowing people to build on their life skills, you know the soft skills that children need. Um, the digital skills that they're going to need, considering that something crazy like 60% of jobs that our children, the Generation Z, will have don't even exist yet. And that's very powerful. Um, And yet we're teaching them, you know, algebra and 
um, Pythagoras theorem in mathematics at school, not how to utilize that in coding an app. You know, yeah, you need it, but you need it in a program format. So, um, you know, this is the kind of stuff that I'm campaigning um, to drive forward. Um, after childbirth, I breastfed for about eight months, and um, then uh, a job opportunity arose. So the company's still running, the first setup company, um, online teaching. Um, we've got math students from the Middle East and from China coming to take our courses. We had, you know, accredited Cambridge and Trinity teachers on the courses. Um, and we built programs for um, languages, but also for um, uh, English and engineering, English and law. I worked with the military and aviation in the Middle East, in Qatar and Oman, to build their English training programs. Um, we've worked with um, uh, maths, science, um, you know, and, and um, students wishing to come to the UK from all different countries and study in UK-based universities to take exams that they would need and preparing them, helping them, um, with visa applications. Um, so as you can see, even in my first business, even in my first real job after uni, it's always been about nurturing. It's always been about taking care of either students or learners or people wanting to come and study in the UK. It's, it's, it's a huge, like, I, I tend to take care of people. Um, or, you know, um, and then... After about, yeah, after about eight months, I decided to go back to work. After I had my daughter, eight months later, I decided to go back to work with a job that came up in um, Cambridge for the Regent Group. And they asked me to be the academic director um, of a school. Uh, and this school has school groups all over the world. Um, and, um, you know, bring the school and the business up with the school principal. Um, that was my first job back, actually, after childbirth. And um, as a female, um, you don't often, females don't often get to speak too much about um, uh, childbirth and breastfeeding and, um, you know, what it's really like to go back to your first job after having a baby and how you feel and how you look. And then you look at yourself and go, oh, you know, like, really? Did I used to look like that? Now I look like this. And just especially with my job, I was standing in front of students, like all the time, like, lots of people. Um, but I remember going back and um, thinking, wow, like, you know, I was so engrossed in, in, um, in the idea of my daughter coming into the world. I was really lost. Like when I went back for my first job, um, I was very lost about or with, um, with where I was at that stage, I remember. And um, I feel like um, you know, when women go back to work after having children, I have never ever worked for a company that has addressed that and that has said to that female, how do you feel? Like, how do you feel? You've just popped something out of your body. That something has become your beautiful, wonderful, gorgeous baby. Um, your body's completely changed. You, you know, your mind's completely changed. And not just mothers, fathers as well. When fathers go back after paternity, I've never seen a company or work for a company that says, how do you feel? You know, how, is there anything we can do to support the fact that you're transitioning from having a screaming, you know, few months year old at home, lack of sleep, not eating properly, you know, lots and lots of people go through depression, you know, like... Doing everything on out of body. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And um, it's just, again... <laughs> <laughs> this, is every, this is the type of lead I don't want to be. I don't want to not ask people what I can do for them. I don't want to not ask uh, mothers or fathers, what can I do for you? You've just come back. You know, you're, everything's changed. You look different. Anyway, so I, I was finding myself again um, with my job in Cambridge. And um, I worked with a wonderful woman called Najar Hussain from Jordan. She was a principal of, of Regent Cambridge at that time. And together we um it was it was great it was um you know like a like a sisterhood she was fantastic we we rose the business up we rose the school up um and i found i found myself in a way where you know i was reminded this is why um you know this is why i was in management at a very young age i can do this you know strive for success and so on and um i love that time 
um, a lot of the students were adult students, so it was quite nice to be able to share life experiences with them. Um, and from Regent Cambridge, I then moved um, to China. So I uprooted um, with my little family of three, and we all moved to China. We didn't move to Beijing or Shanghai, where there were other um, people from, um, you know, the UK or other countries where we would feel um, like we were the only expats. We actually decided to move to a place called Yichang, um, which is in the Hubei province of China. So with COVID-19, I think that that province has been um, um, talked about a lot recently. And we lived amongst a community of the most wonderful, um, um, lovely, family oriented Chinese people um, in our community. It was wonderful. Um, I, I would say China, moving to China taught myself um, and even my daughter, who was four at that time, so much about roots the roots of you know what what fam of course my family taught me about roots but the roots of like you know just things like where you know food stems from in china everything every single recipe starts with ginger chili um soy sauce and everything every single thing has a stem has a root and has a purpose and the reason why it exists in that format the reason we moved to china was because our first the first company that we started up um, did really well in China. And rather than just being an online teaching platform for students, the students wanted to come to the UK to take summer camps in the UK and, um, and take some Cambridge exams in the UK, English, Cambridge English exams. So we then decided to um, go out to China and expand that business with our local Chinese partner who was sending us the online students. Um, and the other thing was that back in the day when we started the first online school, there were three firewalls. Well, there are still now six firewalls, but three firewalls to get through um, to be able to deliver any technology into China. And we thought, you know, why bother messing around with this? Let's just move out there and do it from China. Think outside the box again, right? Let's just do it. Travel. How many yeah. miles is it? <laughs> UK, Middle East, China, right? So yeah. uh, <laughs> people have challenges moving from one city to another, but let's just do China and see where we end. With a four-year-old, awesome. <laughs> awesome. Um, who spoke, you know, who spoke a lot more Chinese than English and ate with chopsticks before a knife and fork when she was four. So uh, you know, she, my daughter loved her time in China. She she made some delightful friends who she's still in touch with right now. And um, so we were in China, we set up this company, we set up this business, and, and we recruited our students. Um, we then went on to build the international department of a um, middle school in China, in the province where we lived, in, in, in um, Yichang, in Hubei. We experienced so many wonderful things, um, huge culture difference. Um, you know, I would, I would recommend um, that any um, person looking into entrepreneurship and becoming um, a startup company, especially those who are looking at international trade and um, dealing with, with the world, that they experience you know, as many countries and cultures as possible and open themselves up to being taught. It's not about what I can, we went out there to teach English and it did not, that was not what it was about. It actually became what they taught us. Fascinating. What a fascinating way. Uh, philosophy as well. It's not what I can teach you. It's what you can teach me. My team, even on my own team within my companies, all of the people that I work with, um, you know, everybody that I've ever hired um, teaches me something new almost every day. And um, I do not lead to teach. I lead to be taught. Um, and I love learning, and I think that that drives, that really drives um, um, ambition and passion and 
you know, because I feel like if I'm just routining and if I'm telling people how to do something, what to do, we're killing, we're killing um, ideas and we're killing originality and uniqueness and authenticity, which are all these things that rebels and misfits have. And, um, you know, sometimes they are seen as um, icons, sometimes they're seen as villains, sometimes they're seen as people you... Um, want to be surrounded by but may not necessarily want to be too close to they're seen as people that are not often understood but yet there's something intriguing about them for me um, yes yes they are all of those things you know however you perceive but they, they are the ones that are going to be the change and they they do change they make change they create change and um, you know if I'm just trying to get results and be results driven um that doesn't lead to change results don't lead to change you know saying that you know kids are out there taking an exam what are we taking that exam for to get results okay so we're taking exams or we are working for some companies that on the job spec it states you know must be um driven and um gain results you know but uh, you in, a, in a matter of education um and maybe you've heard of this because I, I i kind of repeat this story but it's actually preparing everybody for a life of slavery right because mm, you have to do something to get results so yeah. it's the same you have to sit in your cubicle do your job mm. uh and get salary yeah. and and of course listen to the teacher or listen to the director that is actually telling you what yeah. you need to do uh, your opinion or creativity nor innovation or whatever you yeah. come up with is uh, evaluated um and and yeah. the school system of course if you, if your daughter of my son uh, for that matter goes and uh, colors uh, a drawing with sky being purple somebody will come across and say sky is not purple is blue who cares yeah. that's blue with my head it's purple so it's yeah. purple and that Absolutely. kills creativity at very young age Absolutely, absolutely, and I just, for me, um, yeah, it's just it, sometimes it takes my breath away when I've been. So I've seen it from a teacher's side. I've seen it. I've been in the education system. That's why I got out of it so quickly. Um, you know, I've been um, the kid that comes and tries to fit into a society. I've been the woman that has had a child. I've been the person who went and lived in a different country and for me especially the teaching part of my career was the most suppressing part of my career and um, when I as a teacher was teaching something from the curriculum or the syllabus I was given to teach from unless that student said one is a two is b <laughs> Three is A. They were given a cross in red pen. So hang on a minute. We are creating like little armies of children who are being taught to be tested. It's teach to test, teach to test, teach to test. The world no longer is um, okay with that. And, um, you know, and we... It's down to people like ourselves, um, you know, with what you're doing amazingly here, to have a say at everything that is not working very well in education and not working very well in society anymore. And to try and hang on, we, we can't just say it's not working, you know, we have to offer solutions. I'm not sitting here criticizing without having you know, thought of or thought through solutions for every single thing that I've said. And I'm, say, I'm sure it's the same with you. We're not saying this is all that's wrong on your own, go and change it. Not at all. We're saying this is what's wrong. This is what could be done. How can we work together as, you know, the one love, the one unification together, together as, as people to, to, to make the positive change, to be the change maker? Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's clear uh, creating a, a, a community or a platform where, you know, the world is not okay with misfits. I mean, yeah, right? uh, uh, when, when you look at it, it's, it's one to opinionate that something is wrong. Uh, 
mm. uh, offering solution and and actually saying let's do it uh not not you should improve but let's do it together and this is how we can do it yeah. this is the future uh but and and coming back to that when you look at it and misfits so look at the the school system um when they discover a child is brilliant so when somebody's lazy in class they do not get good grades, not because mm. they don't understand, because they're bored with the stuff that is presented to them. Yeah. So they do not get put up, they get put down. So they mm. say your son or daughter are not, um, they do not fit the squares that we have developed for them. Right. So let's move them in uh, uh, um, in an environment where they uh, can get their uh, special needs served. I mean, yeah. uh, unluckily, or or um, how, you can, uh, how you can say it, it's there are people or children that really have special needs because they have some uh, uh, deformity or uh, etc. But um, the the people that have extraordinary needs, I, I maybe you know it, but I do not know any kind of school that says we well we have a department that is for children with extraordinary needs because. This way is boring them to death. Uh, so we're it's putting the method, them there. Absolutely, yeah. It's the method that's used to teach children um, that learn differently. It's to do with you know cognitive development and neuroscience and neurological development. And I think that if we're teaching all children the same way to get the same result without respecting its lack of respect for their neurological differences, we are you know, killing so much within that child's own childhood. It's, a, you know? it's, it's, it's the famous quote. I, I don't know if it's Einstein, but I see his face always on that. Says, Everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by his ability to climb <laughs> trees, he will live his whole life thinking he's stupid. Oh, that I think that is exactly what we're doing. And throughout the whole line, right? Not, yeah. not only education, but job and everything Absolutely. that you're doing. Absolutely. You know, what's accepted as dress, what's accepted as not. I mean, you know, the fact that I walk in as a woman, um, I mean, I'm 33 now, but I remember having my first company and be, being, you know, 23, 24, and now even walking as a female, tattooed all over, like, you know, it's not what you expect from an educational CEO, is it, when they walk into um, a board meeting or something and and when I used when I was a teacher and I was 23, I'd walk into the classroom and they would say, oh, you're, which which country are you from, um, new student? Or hello, hi, I'm this. And they would expect me to teach them um, to be the student, but I was actually the teacher. So I'd be like, oh, oh, I'm not just, oh, actually, I'm the school director and I'm going to teach you today because your teacher's off. They're not feeling well. <laughs> <You're> like, what? <laughs> What? What? Yes. <laughs> so um, this idea of again, it's challenging the status quo. But the more I challenge, the more that I'm that I feel progress, and that I've it, let me tell you now, I've never not been accepted. This is uh, it's not even me saying I've not been accepted. Um, it's just me saying that the that the world hadn't made a place for me unless I made it for myself. And, um, you know, it, it didn't just make it. Society didn't make me a place. The school system definitely didn't make me a place. Um, the job system ha did not make me a place. I, I took my own folding chair and I put it at a table that had no seats for me. So, um, again, I, I, I feel like, um, you know, there are many, many tables, you know, going into a banquet or something, and sometimes all the seats are taken. And you know when those seats are taken then like what do you do do you not go and sit down do you stand up and eat your food I don't I just take a chair and put it down and it's like this was this is based on a quote and based on the mentality of um, a lady called um, Shirley Ch Chisholm who was one of the first ladies to run for president and she she this famous quote comes from her and it's along the lines of um if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring your own folding chair. Um, I raised my eight-year-old with that quote, um, <laughs> you know, and um, I would I would recommend that to, to females and males all over. Um, you know, it's like, uh, okay, um, it's not even that I want to sit at your table. It's that I actually just need a table to sit and eat my food too and um you know you may not want me to sit at this table it's okay I'll build another table 
but I'm going to sit here for now because you told me I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Just so because like, somebody told you, you couldn't. Do, <laughs> and I can do this. <laughs> While you're eating, I'm eating and I'm building my next thing. No, <laughs> I'm probably, the next probably if somebody would invite you and say, I save the chair, you would say, oh, no, that's too easy. I don't want to sit at your table. <laughs> now, and then if they turned around and said, I'll get you the chair. Oh, no, no, it's okay. I'll go over there. You know, but it's like, <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I did. Uh, where did we get to? China. And then coming back, going to Cambridge. Um, again, just not fitting in. And then when I came back from China in 2015, um, I was offered an opportunity with Kaplan International, who's a global um, corporate giant. Um, back in two, 2015, they were turning over about five billion um, US dollars a year. Um, I think they've seen profit decreases um, recently, obviously due to COVID nineteen, and with education becoming more um, technology based, um, with their uh, with them being predominantly a school and, and physical walls college university business um, however back in 2015 they were doing exceptionally well and they um, had a role um, for a person to come in and to take over their global digital strategy and their whole portfolio of glo- of um, digital products and um, I was um, I had a call I wouldn't really call it an interview I was um, talked to by um, two ladies leading that part of Kaplan at that time and after that conversation I had an offer that I couldn't refuse um via email Godfather was involved <laughs> pardon god of godfather was involved you got, <laughs> you, you got an offer you couldn't refuse I'm just kidding <laughs> but I do get the joke because I love that <laughs> <laughs> And I am an ethical gangster, so it's okay. <laughs> okay. That goes on your the ethical gangster podcast with an ethical I'm gangster. An ethical gangster, yeah. And I don't obey. Um so <laughs> you know, um apart to ethics. Um apart from two ethics. Um anyway, so when I was interviewed for this job, um, you know, uh, it wasn't really an interview. I was asked to come back and lead the digital department of a new business initiative sector of Kaplan. So, um, and that was, you'll see on my profile, it says Picaro World. So Picaro is, um, I, I led the department, all of the digital pro- products within that department and the global strategy, the spread of the, um, you know, the, the um, I've got quite a, a nice array of um, contacts and people that I can turn to at any time, um, you know, business colleagues and dear friends um, who I have worked. I work very, very um openly honestly and you know with a lot of passion on making um valuable and loved um, business relationships with key partners and people around the world and I try my best to work with people according to you know their way their need their style and their culture you know religions cultures races um and, and because I'm always wanting to as I said before be taught by people on a daily basis I really am willing to learn at all times. And um, rather than going out to um, uh, companies or business partners and saying, we're going to do it this way, which is what corporates tend to do, I went out there and said, how can we do this according to, you know, what happens in your country or what you need for your institution or how you want to change, you know, the lives of these children um, or, or, you know, for example. And um, in Kaplan, I went in and I created a stir and the company started to look more positively into the future. The product, especially one product, Picaro, which I really loved because it did what it said on the box. Um, And I partnered them up with some global partners across the Middle East, Northern Africa, Asia, um, and started expanding it. And then um, the company was divesting Um, certain aspects of the new business initiative section and by this time I still had no money so um, you know and the money that we made in the Middle East went into investing in the first company Um, I I think I had about 2,500 pounds in my pocket at that time Um, and this opportunity to um, buy out Picaro was going to be sold by Kaplan 
um, to the highest bidders, basically. Um, and they were Pearson, um, Macmillan, McGraw-Hill, um, and the likes and thereof, big, big publishers. And um, I kept on looking at this product thinking, oh, I, I, can, I can do this, you know, let's do. And, and a few days later, after thinking of what can I do with the product to save it going to one of the larger publishers, um, I decided that a management buyout would be a really good idea. <laughs> um, and that that management buyout would happen upon a shit hot business plan not um not with physical cash <laughs> so i went up against these um these big publishing giants and managed to um take picker over um from Kaplan, um which was then in 10 countries and is now in 59 countries so i incorporated the company in 2016 and have grown it um cross global um in since 2016 to 2020 so at four years we've gone up 49 countries and we've wow. partnered so now we're 59 countries all together um so after taking over picaro and seeing how um how we grew that product as a startup in accordance to how it was being done in the corporate I was like, wow. And not only that, stripping the product of all the corporate stuff, um, the cost saving was huge. Like, you know, you, you, you strip off all of those things that the corporates add. It's like, you know, things that, that let's hire 250 people to develop this product. Let's not, why, why not just give it to three really good people that can do 10 times a quicker job? you know, and so on. So when once I stripped Picker of its corporate um, identity um, and and used what we had but repackaged it in a different way, it's about utilising what you have, but it's how you package or repackage at times. If you don't have money, repackage it. Don't create something new. Don't go and buy something new. You know, wear an outfit with a belt. Turn your hat the other way around. You know, create something from what you have. Don't always look to have you know more or don't always look at money as a solution to everything and I think if you if you because obviously with my family my father had he was he was very successful but then in the war we went from having everything to nothing um so I then had to start again I built everything I have now from absolutely ground zero everything every single thing you know the clothes on my back um the the, the things in my home the artwork <laughs> that I've been collecting, everything came from absolutely nothing. And, um, you know, after the, the, the Picaro buy it, when people saw that Picaro was doing well, they kept on asking for advice and they were asking for um, pricing, global pricing strategies. They were asking, you know, how to formulate these collections, how to grow their digital strategy, what to do next with their social media. And I thought, oh, um, you know, back in 2016, um, I really fancy like having a hub of people who are, you know, entrepreneurial, they're, they're leading startups, they're a bit different, bit quirky, again, they don't fit in, but they have like a vision of where they want to take the education sector. Let's start up or found and then I founded the um, EdTech Lobby. That's that's the company that arose after I listened to what requests were coming at us. And the EdTech Lobby um, is my um, company which um people come to us when they have a great product an idea or um, a service and they want that product idea or service to go global very simple because the edtech lobby currently um works around edtech obviously predominantly most of our partners are in education technology assessment um, training and so on but the foundations of the strategy that I feel we've built up as the EdTech Lobby can apply and over apply to any company or business. And basically, the EdTech Lobby was an idea that I had after four glasses of beautiful red wine. And the people around the table at that time, I remember, were all corporate and said, oh, God, you're crazy. You know, you're crazy. This isn't going to work. It's too early. Um, you know, I'm not sure the world sees this, this EdTech thing. 
And then it boomed two years later, and we'd already started the edit lobby, thankfully. Um, but I was like, okay, you tell me if you tell me that I can't, I'm so going to go and do it. I mean, anyone, <laughs> I'm so going to go and do it just because no, no. Um, but no, I've been. I managed to take some of the people who work with me at Kaplan, the wonderful people that work with me at Kaplan, into the edtech lobby as well, and they're still with me today. So I've still got the same people that I took back from Kaplan. Um, with me today wonderful wonderful human beings Uh, they're the vision they're the drive you know they're my right and left hand leg arm everything and um, you know I work as hard as I do obviously you know for them as much as um, you know for the human race and kids and 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 the future of the planet and my family Um, and do you know what I, I just thought to myself I didn't even say myself in that whole list and the reason I don't think I said myself was because it really doesn't doesn't give me as much um satisfaction and um sense of achievement to work um building up myself if I'm not building up other people unless I'm building up others and you know the environment that we live in and and and, you know the world as it is it really wouldn't provide me near enough as much um satisfaction as it does when I'm doing it for other people as well um you know it's like giving a present or receiving a present um personally I'd much rather always um, much rather always give the gift than you know have to receive a gift um so I believe that a, a good leader leadership is about growing everything and everybody around you as well as um all that you call yours um you know and and I think that our millennial slash generation z um society hopefully will drive towards that if we don't make them um you know try and be like everybody else up up until now and um yeah so the edtech lobby was founded and along the way you know with the edtech lobby I've been asked to um chair and to be the co-founder of and to be the um, boards person um, advisor um, consultant Um, I've had a few roles since then and I tend to basically be the firefighter so I'll go into a company put out the fires get it to where it needs to go and then move on right and um, I like to work at things I like to build them I like to grow them Um, whether that be something that I've got that needs repackaging or whether that be something that I need to start from ground zero. It doesn't phase me. Um, You know, after what I experienced as a child, and I've said this to you um, shortly already, um, nothing phases me. I do not get, um, you know, again, now during COVID, it's been devastating and everything. But for me, um, again, not being able to go to the shop and get yeast and flour to 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 make homemade bread um I was okay because I've had to live with a lot less and it really just hasn't phased me to be honest and I believe that I I was always somehow preparing for where the world is at where when when you know the world has stopped I feel like I'm like on a thousand miles an hour right now while everything else is just like eh, I'm like boom so much so that in the last month um, I have um, come up with a new business idea <laughs> and I have registered and started up I a new company. One coming. <laughs> I saw that one coming. <laughs> what did I do during COVID-19? Well, I was a psychologist for everybody around me. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've, I've, I've really tried during COVID-19 to support um, other people in my position, so other company um, directors, CEOs, um, people who are leading other people, because, you know, I I try so hard to make sure that, you know, my team have what they need to live their lives. You know, I'm responsible for the people that are within my team. I'm responsible for the people that get my products. Um, so I've, I've spent a lot of time during COVID-19 taking care of, obviously, my family and my close friends, but also... Um, the people around me that make what I do possible every single day. And that might have been just, you know, somebody might have messaged me something on LinkedIn and said, hey, Danny, um, you know, uh, do you have advice on this? Yeah, of course. Like, just take the time. We've had that. We've all had the time to make a difference during COVID-19. I'm sorry, but if the world has stopped, no matter how much work you're doing at home, 
um, you know, everyone's had a little bit more extra time, you know, and that little bit of extra time, wherever that may have been, by choice for me was used to help other people. Um, and the other bit of that spare time that I've had as well as homeschooling and obviously the cleaner can't come anymore. So obviously it's becoming my own everything. Um, you know, like not going to the hair salon or getting my nails done or anything, you know, now I have this time and I thought, what should I do? And I've been really passionate about um, doing something outside of education. So um, looking at, you know, where the research I put into the education industry has taught me a lot about what is the next big thing in business? What What is the next big thing that, that we need to get out as you know, people who are going to be on planet Earth for the future. What What's coming? And I've been really interested in, um, you know, um, organic um, products, organic sourced um, materials um, and ethically sourced materials and, um, you know, how to make the world a greener and a better place. So I've decided, dun, 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 one of the first people that knows this, Amir, um, that I would start up a company um, for um, hemp hemp products. So we're going to do a hemp clothing range where the hemp is sustainable and ethically sourced. Um, it's going to we are then going to do other products um, in skincare with our Asian and Korean partners um, who are leading skincare at the moment. So I've invited them to join, um, and they will be um, cruelty free, vegan. Um, you know, we're looking at doing um, a food, a food um, selection. Um, we're looking at doing just some really cool stuff um, uh, for the future of the planet. That um, you know is is fun. It's stuff that I like to do every day. I like to eat good food, and I like to um, know where my clothes come from. I like to know where you know, where the things, the shoes on my feet come from, you know, how they're made. The, the, Traceability. The, absolutely, yeah. And um, so, yeah, this is this is a new brand that I'm starting. Um, once it's all set up and running, um, I will make sure that you know about it. Um, and, and, you know. Looking forward. And uh, I just think, and, and also it's the first time actually that I've start that I'm starting a company with a collective of amazing cool people. It's not just a company that I've gone, hi, I'm Danny, I'm gonna start this company up, I'm gonna hire people to work, and so on. This is the first company I'm starting where from the word go, it's built up of a collective of amazing people. You should that- talk with <laughs> or listen to um uh, to the podcast with uh, the, um, Damir Perkic. He's actually making bioplastic from sugar root I don't know if yeah he's, he's based in in the sugar cane. sugary yeah sugar yeah cane. Oh, yes. yeah sugar cane. yeah yeah fantastic i've researched it yeah fantastic <laughs> yes yes and do you know what in um um bosonska krupa you've got bihaj bosonska krupa and then towards kozarats we have there's another Bosonski little Novi. before before bosonski novi before the bridge Mm. Um, it was it was a place used in the war a lot. Um, very close. That's It'll come to me. No man's but, land. <laughs> but they have just up from my mother's house in Bosnia. They have the um, water, the water source, the natural water source and supply, and they're bottling it. Um, I cannot yeah, I come up with the name. Back to you on that one, yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> 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 We've been away too long. Um, so yeah, this is this is a brand new company that I'm starting up, um, and you know I'm just inviting lots of cool people to be part of it and to drive, you know, this this change that we all need to make in in recycling, reusing, um, ethically sourcing, being cruelty free, um, you know, to to try and support and help. And also, it's a company that is ready for Gen Z to come and be part of. It's not a company that's keeping out these crazy thinking new newbies. Um, you know, we're inviting them all to be part of it. Um, so I'm really Art. excited about that. Um, and yeah, that's it really. And I, I, that's where I've got to in life at the moment. Wow. <laughs> uh, I actually have, I don't have any questions uh, uh, <laughs> anymore. You've answered them by, <laughs> by automation. 
so <laughs> I, w- I would ask you, is there something that I that I should have asked, but I didn't, but <laughs> I yeah. think I, I have it all. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to put it all into a book at the moment with my uh, with, with a dear writer um, colleague and friend of mine. So there there'll be a book about the um, the life journey and the experiences, and um, the book reveals um, you know a lot more detail about um, that transition between Bosnia to England, my childhood, um, you know, going through um, various psychopathic tests as a child and as a teenager, and being part of these actual tests. I don't think they could get anything out of me. And, you know, um, I'm working kind of at a pace and a speed that I do um, my ADHD brain. Um, there's all of these things that are being, that are coming out that, by the way, you know, talking to you like this, um, I don't tend to do too many interviews. I don't do tend to do too many um, things like this. So, um, you know, from, from the first message you sent me, the way that we've resonated and connected is something very powerful. And I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm saving energy and time for people who are ready to do this and who want to do this. And um, so, no, I'm thrilled and I'm so thankful that we've had this opportunity because funnily enough, so because I love listening to other people and learning from other people, it's actually quite rare that people stop and say, but, and, and ask you questions especially when in my position I'm always the one that people are like how do I do this what should I do here or what are your ideas here it's not very often that people would stop and ask you know you know how do you feel about that or what do you think about that or what was your experience in that it's like you know genuine you interested in genuine interest in how do you do it <laughs> what do you do and why do you do it yeah um, yeah, absolutely. And I just think that trust your own idea. I'm trying to guide people to trust their own ideas enough, um, you know, because if you don't, you won't you won't challenge your status quo. And if you don't, um, you know, I, I feel like this status quo is, is only something that um, has been put on us, like chains. I feel like it's like a chain. And I'm tired and I'm trying to run in this direction. I can't, it pulls me back. And I try and run in this direction and I can't, it pulls me back again. So, I, you know, just rip them off and then, you know, off you go. Um, be true to who you are no matter what. Um, I, so many people from my culture were ashamed of being from my culture because of what happened to them because, you know, they couldn't afford the, the better the more expensive crisps at school so they would hide where they're from or you know they were embarrassed when their parents would come into the playground and speak a different language um so be true to your roots utilize what comes from your roots and your origin in what you do today um you know and being true to yourself and the people around you is is so powerful. trust trust is something that the power of you know media corporates um and and so many of these massive giants has killed in so many people and trust is is key to any relationship and i think that if we can build it through just the thing that's free for everybody being true and loving these are free you don't have to pay to be true um i feel like we can we can do anything i really feel that we can do anything and um you know Going into the future, transparency is key. It's key everywhere, you know. Literally build buildings with glass walls. That's what the world wants. They want to know where things come from, where things are sourced from, what, you know, what their child's being taught and how. And um, transparency is key. Trust and love, I think. That will get us, that will get us far. Well, that's a, a beautiful key takeaway for the end of the podcast. And I, I really can thank you enough for your amazing story of hardship, resilience, and kicking the world's ass while loving and hugging everybody. So uh, <laughs> I'm certain I'm certain that all of our listeners will be amazed. And I'm really looking forward to both your new business and brand as to that book. So please, uh, please keep us updated. Yeah, absolutely. Stay passionate. Stay passionate. <laughs> Always, always. Remember that <laughs> great ideas and visions are fueled by passion, not position of power. And I just think if we all just remind ourselves, passion is the power, we'll be okay. And bring your folding chair. And bring your bloody folding chair. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Otherwise, you may not get a seat. <laughs> <laughs> that's that, that that's it folding chips that's the, <laughs> that's the way isn't it that's the way you know, that's doing the COVID, way. a folding chair you can take it to the park and have a garden if you live in an apartment otherwise you're stuck indoors you know folding chairs everywhere they just allow up more people to join it's a collective it should be a unison everybody should be welcome and that's exactly what a folding chair does it allows more and more people to come and sit that's it Bring your folding chair dot com. <laughs> yes, I mean, let's do this. <laughs> I'm always welcome to new ideas. <laughs> Sounds awesome. Let's just register it and create a new community. Okay, Bring now, your folding yeah, chair. Today. <laughs> Colorful. New business idea. Daniela, it was um, really awesome talking to you. Thank you. Thank you uh, oh, thank very you much. So much. And um I mean, success and, and Godspeed and everything do you do, but I believe that's all fine already. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and of course, let me know what we can do to um, push what you're doing here, which is amazing, um, out there and support in any shape or form that we can, um, you know, as a gesture of goodwill and love from our side. And um, thank you again. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Likewise. Stay safe and healthy. You too. Take care of yourself. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much for listening. This was Daniela Trolich. Join me next week for the interview with Chantal van der Berg. She is neuroscience and neuromarketer. And here is a short part of our interview. Yeah, there is. And it's so simple, but we don't use it. You, you, you mentioned the, the needs of customers. But what we do is... Um, uh, think of that need in uh, a way of uh, knowledge, not in a way of emotions and feelings. So, um, why do I need toothpaste? Um, do I need toothpaste for um, white teeth? Perhaps. But perhaps I um, need those white teeth so that I become uh, more attractive to another person or to make me feel um, secure. Are you curious about the rest of the story? Tune in next week and listen to everything Chantal has to say about neuroscience and neuromarketing and how you can apply it also. For now, this was Challenging the Status Quo podcast with your host, Amir Sabirovic. Stay safe and healthy, and until next time, see ya!